When I was a girl, my brother told me it was made with a thousand swords from Aegon's fallen enemies. Hi everyone, it's Charlie. This is going to be my Game of Thrones finale video. So here we go. We have so much to talk about. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the Game of Thrones videos. I'll start talking about the Game of Thrones prequel series, which is a completely different creative team, but that'll be a little bit later this week after we get done talking about the finale and processing everything. There's a new round of the HBO Now giveaway. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave a comment about the finale on the video. Obviously, a spoiler warning for everything in the Game of Thrones finale. Because there's so much to get through, I just did this as a top 20 video instead of like the normal top 15 or top 10 that I would do. So starting with number 20, the title of the episode and the new intro, they changed some of the things about the intro because of all the damage to King's Landing last week. The title of the episode, maybe you're not surprised by this, was The Iron Throne. HBO's whole marketing campaign for season 8 was for the throne, so it makes sense that they would reference The Iron Throne in the finale title in some way. I was hoping it would be a reference to one of the books, but I feel like this is also probably acceptable. It was either going to be Dream of Spring or some reference to like a Time of Wolves, which used to be the old title that George R. Martin had for Dream of Spring until he changed it. So in a way, it is a time for wolves now because the Stark family has almost, you could say, won the Game of Thrones effectively, even though the Stark that wound up on the throne wasn't the obvious choice. As I said, they changed King's Landing in the intro, the little model of it, to reflect all the battle damage from episode 5. So the gates have been blown open, the Red Keep had been torn down just a little bit, but as we all saw during the episode, surprisingly, the only thing in the throne room left standing was the Iron Throne itself. The other thing that I liked about the intro is that you basically pick up with Tyrion doing almost the exact same thing that he did during Season 7, Episode 4, witnessing all the horror of what Daenerys had done burning all those Lannister troops, only now it's on a much, much bigger scale. So the way they filmed it was also really cool, too, to put you in Tyrion's head, just to give you a sense for the horror and all the shock that he was going through in this moment. Number 19, they come on Grey Worm, who's executing all the Lannister soldiers that they've captured and defeated. Daenerys has commanded us to kill everyone who serves Cersei Lannister, so that's what we're going to do. And even though it looks like he and Jon Snow were going to throw down into a fight, I didn't actually expect there to be any fighting. I think they just wanted to let you know that the Unsullied were going to continue to be a big problem for them in the future, regardless of what would happen to Daenerys. So I know a lot of you are upset about what happened to Jon Snow at the end. I'll talk about that. Don't worry. We'll get into all the endings for all the Stark characters. But you have to remember that the Unsullied would have always been a big problem had they not given them that win. Number 18, Tyrion walks back through the wreckage of the Red Keep. When he walks back through this room, he's mostly thinking about his time as Hand of the King because that was all season two. Then his time there with Tywin Lannister when Tywin became Hand of the King. So he spent a lot of time in this room here. Then obviously it sort of brings it full circle when he becomes the new Hand of the King at the end of the episode. But we're still mostly in shock and horror mode. So he obviously takes the torch down into the basement to the escape route to see if Jamie and Cersei got out and finds their bodies. So the music of the episode finally cuts in once he sees their faces and starts breaking down crying. And it's a remix of the Reigns of Castamere, which they've kind of been using as a Lannister theme for the past couple of seasons. So pretty much the first half of the episode is all really, really sad. Everyone's either completely horrified at what's happened or they're just crying openly. Like you saw the northern soldier that they walked by on their way to the Red Keep just breaking down into tears. Nobody except for the Unsullied and the Dothraki can handle it, but they're super jazzed up. They're like, oh yeah, this is going to be awesome. This new regime, we're going to go around and liberate the world. So number 17, Daenerys makes her grand entrance and I love the way that they shot her in front of Drogon. So when his wings unfurl, it's almost like she's the dragon you've woken the dragon like Viserys used to say you don't want to wake the dragon do you and she gives them her best dictator speech so it's this grand victory celebration she gets them all stoked up about this new campaign that she's going to start all over the world and suddenly it starts to sink in like you look at Tyrion and Jon Snow looking at each other I loved a lot of the non-verbal acting that they did the first half of the episode when they're just kind of reacting not sure what to do about Daenerys I'll talk about what happened to the Dothraki and the Unsullied at the end of the episode too, because I know like there's this big idea of a campaign that they're not really going on anymore. Daenerys names off a couple big places that we haven't visited in Game of Thrones yet. There's a lot of places on the southern parts of the map that we've never actually visited, like Sotheros. So I think that the prequel series is going to pick up with some of those. Tyrion quits his Hand of the King, which seems pretty logical. It seems like he was building to that moment, like, I can't have any of this. But predictably, she arrests him because she found out about him freeing Jaime. So after she gives Jon Snow a look, like she registers his disappointment, Arya shows up next to Jon like a ninja, and people start planting the idea to get rid of Daenerys into Jon's head. 
You have to kill her. There's no way that Sansa is ever going to bend the knee. Remember during episode two when they were talking about potentially letting the North be independent and Daenerys just recoiled at the thought like there's no way that she's going to allow the North to be free. Jon Snow seemed like he was genuinely surprised with her skills. I don't think that he ever saw her steal a face though so maybe someday she'll talk to him about that because at the end of the episode even though she says I'm not coming back it's always possible that a future version of Arya way down the road could come back and visit a very old version of Jon Snow. 15 Jon goes to visit Tyrion. They make a couple jokes. There's a couple references to dialogue from early in the series. He also references something that Maester Aemon said, love is the death of duty. So Aemon was actually talking about all the times that he had to not go help his family after he had taken the black. Remember, Maester Aemon is very old, so he took the Black after the period of the Black by Rebellion, after that settled down, with the Blood Raven, who also took the Black at the same time, but he was much older at the time before he became the Three-Eyed Raven. Maester Aemon took the Black when he was a young man, so all these subsequent wars and problems in the Targaryen family, he just had to sit out and watch it all play while he was up at the Wall. One of his great regrets most recently was during Robert's Rebellion. He wasn't able to come to Daenerys' aid. He was talking about a Targaryen alone in the world being a very terrible thing. A lot of Tyrion's conversation with Jon Snow is referencing things that people were trying to deal with after last week's episode. So there were a lot of people after Daenerys burned King's Landing that were trying to point to all the things that foreshadowed that she was going to be doing something like this. Jon sort of takes the voice of all the other people trying to defend Daenerys. He actually does try to defend Daenerys' actions for a brief period. It's just that stupid, stubborn, Ned Stark level honor that always gets him into trouble. She's my queen. It will be for her to decide who sits on the Iron Throne. The only thing that really gets John is when Tyrion kind of slips in that line about his sisters. Do you think that your sisters will ever bend the knee? So it's not really clear what moment exactly Jon Snow makes up his mind, but I think it's while he's walking to the Iron Throne room, by the time he has that last speech with Daenerys before he decides what he's going to do. Even though it totally wasn't necessary, I love the scene of Jon trying to slowly edge his way by Drogon, who was just sleeping underneath that pile of snow. And it was snow, so I will talk about Daenerys' vision in the House of the Undying. Number 14, though, they obviously pay off that vision with a couple minor edits, like they destroyed way more of the throne room. I think that was just to be truer to the actual damage that she had done and to let more light in because it's very dark during that scene when she's in the House of the Undying. So miraculously, the only thing that survived in that room was the Iron Throne itself, and just like her vision, she reaches out and touches it with a hand. This is almost the exact same scene. Amelia Clark actually said that this was the very last scene that she filmed. It was just a small insert of her hand, which is obviously the scene of her reaching to touch the Iron Throne, the thing that she's fought for this whole time. Just like in the vision, she does not get a chance to sit on the Iron Throne, though, before Jon Snow walks in. And, you know, whatever she was feeling in that moment earlier when she gave him that look, she's completely past it. She's drinking her own Kool-Aid. She's excited to build this new world by force, it seems. And Jon Snow is still just trying to talk her out of it. What about all the children? Have you seen any of the destruction on the streets? Even though I never felt like Amelia Clark and Kit Harington had great chemistry together, so I never really bought them as a couple, I did love this scene. Obviously, they had to nail it because it was such an important scene. So I do think that regardless of what you think about the script, they did a great job of performing that. Number 13, though, Jon Snow obviously says, you'll always be my queen and winds up killing her. I think the exact moment that he finally decided that he had to kill her was when she said those other people, when he references, what about all the other people and what they think is a good idea, is when Daenerys says those other people don't get to decide. So it's basically her giving her really great tyrant speech, having drunken all of her own Kool-Aid, then fulfilling the prophecy from the next part of her vision of the House of the Undying. Before she actually gets to sit on the Iron Throne, she walks through this door into the afterlife where she sees Khal Drogo and her baby Rago that died. Predictably, number 12, Drogon senses that something's wrong, comes to find Daenerys. You do kind of think that he's going to kill Jon for a second until he just unleashes flame everywhere in his grief. I know it seemed weird that he melted the Iron Throne specifically. Like, you wonder how smart he is. Like, is he burning that on purpose or is he just breathing out flame because he's in distress? I think it's more that he's in distress and they just filmed it in a way that seemed coincidental. Like, oh, he just happens to be melting the Iron Throne, this thing that Daenerys had been fighting for her whole life. I mostly expected going into the episode that they would destroy the Iron Throne in one way or another, and the only way to melt it down like that is to use dragon fire, because when Aegon was forging the Iron Throne after the conquest, he had to use Balerion the Black Dread to help smelt all the swords. It actually took them months. In the books, the story is, is that it was actually smiths that made it like you smith would make a sword, so they made the Iron Throne 
but because they're not artisan craftsmen, this way the real Iron Throne of the books is so asymmetrical looking. One of her lines of dialogue to the story she tells that Viserys told me as a child about the Iron Throne, a thousand swords, imagine what that looks like to a little girl. It's just the writers making a really meta joke about their version of the Iron Throne because this is obviously not a thousand swords. This is what a thousand swords looks like. But the reason why they didn't make this version of the Iron Throne for the TV show is because it'd be way too unwieldy to film. So they just had to make something that would fit on camera better. Drogon flies away with her body headed east. We don't know what he's going to be doing going forward, but Bran makes a reference saying maybe I can find him. Like I think that's a joke about him potentially warging the dragon because it's been such a big fan theory for so long and him just using his normal abilities to warg ravens and other animals to just get information when he wants it. There's a small time jump. We learned that Tyrion and Jon Snow have been imprisoned by the Unsullied for several weeks because you see all this beard growth on Tyrion. So number 11, there's been enough time for a great council to form and you have all the different realms being represented by a lot of people that are familiar. There are a couple of new people here too. There's Sansa and Arya representing the North, Gendry representing the Stormlands with one of his new bannermen, Edmure Tully representing the Riverlands, Brienne and Davos, I don't know exactly which region they're going to be representing, but Yara Greyjoy representing the Iron Islands, Sweet Robin and Jan Royce representing the Vale, and then the new Prince of Dorne. I don't know who this actor is, I don't know which family he belongs to, if he's a Martell or if he's one of their cousins, but they're basically trying to placate the Unsullied because the Unsullied and the Dothraki still control King's Landing, but there's a northern army outside the gates because they want to get Jon Snow back. Davos even offers Grey Worm and the Unsullied land in the Reach to form their own house, and he's like, nope, not having it, but he wants justice. He's out for blood, so they have to make the deal with them. So a lot of this gets into the logic of how they send Jon Snow back to the north. But they need a new king. So number 10, Tyrion gives his big speech about why Bran should be king. Bran the Broken, first of his name, because stories are what bring all them together and Bran has all the best stories. He literally a living memory of everything in human history. So of course he has the best stories. But remember, he's also the keeper of everyone's secrets as well. So the other reason why he's a really good king is because of his ability to gather information. Like he does kind of need a master of whispers, as he says later. But because he can warg the ravens and other animals, he can get whatever information he wants from anywhere. He even says, why do you think I came down this whole way when they offer him the crown? Because he's basically saying that I saw this in the future. I knew it was going to happen. I'm sure we'll be talking about the logic of picking Bran as king going forward because a lot of people were expecting Jon Snow to sit on the Iron Throne. So you guys can let me know in the comments, what do you think about the logic of the choice? And, you know, given some of Bran's skills, I think as long as he has the right people around him, which it kind of seems like he does, he should be okay. And the way that Isaac Hempstead Wright explains it is, is that this version of Bran, having had his powers for a couple seasons now has gotten better at using them and is therefore more able to interact with people like an actual person would. Whereas way back at the beginning of season seven, when he first came back to Winterfell, he was a little bit more like a turnip. All hail King Turnip, first of his name. Big changes to the realm going forward though. Number nine, Sansa claims that the North has fought too hard and lost too much. They're never going to bend the knee. So she wants to remain independent. Bran, now acting as king, allows that to happen. He says, okay, fine. You get to be independent. So Sansa is technically queen in the north. They even cheer her at the end of the episode when they put the crown on her head, just like they cheered Jon Snow when they named him king in the north at the end of season six. But all the other realms are still going to be part of Bran's new regime, including Dorne. So they have a joke about it when Tyrion says, all hail Bran, king of the six kingdoms. Number eight, though, big surprise. Bran names Tyrion his hand of the king and his penance for all the bad things that he's done. He reminds them about killing Shay, about killing Tywin. Even the Unsullied still want his head because of his role in Daenerys' death. But Bran says that he's going to serve penance by helping make the realm better one day at a time for the rest of his life. This is one of those interesting scenarios where I feel like either one would have been a good option for Tyrion's character as part of his character arc. He does work really well as Hand of the King, but it also would have been an appropriately bittersweet ending for his character would he have been executed by Daenerys or the Unsullied. Seven, the compromise with the Unsullied to keep them from starting another protracted war in King's Landing is to make Jon Snow take the Black is consequence for killing Daenerys. So if you were confused by why they had to do that, it was because the Unsullied had almost the exact same number of troops that all the other northern allied forces have, and even Yara Greyjoy was still Team Daenerys. So even though they kind of throw Jon Snow under the bus, I think that Jon Snow accepts it knowing that he belongs in the north like Tormund says, and he's just so sad about what he had to 
do to Daenerys because he really did love her. If it wasn't clear, I know obviously they didn't have a lot of chemistry together as actors. So number six, we start to get all of our goodbyes. This is sort of the Lord of the Rings versions of the endings from Return of the King where you get four or five different endings for all the different characters. Starting with the first one, Grey Worm watches Jon Snow walk by, still hates his guts, but he tells the other Unsullied that they're headed down to Noth, which is basically him fulfilling his promise to Missandei. It seems like the Dothraki are either headed to the Reach as part of Davos's offer, just giving them some land, or they're headed back to the east, back to the Great Grass Sea. Five, all the Stark children get their final goodbye, Sansa, Arya, and Bran. Jon says Arya is welcome to come visit him, like I said, but it doesn't seem like Arya is planning on coming back any time in the next 10 to 20 years. She references her line of dialogue from season six, I think it was either episode eight or one of the middle episodes, where she's talking about what's west of Westeros. So if we're talking about satisfying conclusions for characters, I feel like Arya's conclusion is pretty satisfying. Sansa's makes sense as well. We all kind of expected her to become Queen of the North. Four, Brienne becomes the new commander of the King's Guard wearing the golden armor. She looks through the white book of names. She sees Arthur Dane, Barristan Selmy, and then Jaime Lannister and continues filling in the rest of his great deeds the last couple of seasons. The really interesting thing about Brienne's love story with Jaime and her becoming the Lord Commander of the King's Guard is it also mirrors Barristan Selmy's story because he was Commander of the King's Guard for a long time. Brienne did not get to be with the person that she loved, so it was destined to be tragic romance. Barristan Selmy was also in love with Ashara Dane as a young person, but did not get to be with her because she killed herself when she learned of Arthur Dane's fate at the Tower of Joy. She threw herself from the battlements. Three is the new small council, so Tyrion has a funny moment he's sort of settling in, and obviously it's a big callback to season two when he became Hand of the King during the early seasons. But his small council is now Bronn, who is Master of Coin. They're going to finance the reconstruction of King's Landing because of all that damage. Davos is the new Master of Ships. Samwell is the new Grand Maester. I felt like that was a very appropriate choice. And then obviously they say that they need a new Master of Laws, a new Master of Whispers, and a new Master of War. And big surprise, Bronn got that bigger castle. He wound up getting Highgarden. The only thing that I was not really happy about with this scene was them actually doing the Lord of the Rings ending where Frodo is finishing Bilbo's book, A Lord of the Rings, and he writes it down. Oh, Maester Ebros finished his book about the wars after Robert's Rebellion. I helped him with the title. It's called A Song of Ice and Fire. Maybe you laughed during that scene, but I felt like they could have done without that joke. Also, Tyrion tries to tell his honeycomb brothel story again. I'll do a separate video talking about that too, because I think we've actually figured what the story out is. Podrick is also part of the King's Guard you find too, and he's the one who is now charged with wheeling Bran all over the Red Keep wherever he wants to go. Number two is A Time for Wolves, The Ascension of the Stark Children. So remember, like I said, George R. R. Martin's original title for the final book in A Song of Ice and Fire was going to be called A Time for Wolves. Sansa being crowned queen in the north, wearing a new gray dress that looks kind of like the heart tree because it's got those red leaves all over it. Arya still has her Valyrian dagger and is on the ship with the Stark sigil sailing west of Westeros to the mysterious western continent that we don't really know anything about. Then John arrives at Castle Black and becomes the new 1000th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. He's both the 998th Lord Commander. Then remember, he passed the duty on to Ed, who became the 999th Lord Commander. So now that Jon Snow is back, he's even number 1000. So you kind of see how they did that. Ghost is there. He gives him all the good boy pets and hugs that he deserves. So we finally got that. I was really happy that they finally had a ghost scene at the end. But then number one, their final scene is of them walking north of the wall, taking the wildlings back to what is now their territory again. And you see this little green plant growing up right next to the wall. I think that's just a reference to a dream of spring, as in things are getting warmer, they're getting better. Everything that was destroyed during the war with the White Walkers and then with each other in the realm, the Civil War, is going to grow back. But you notice that the theme song that they're playing is actually a remix of the Stark theme mixed with the official Game of Thrones theme. They also played a remix of the Game of Thrones theme when Daenerys was touching the Iron Throne earlier too. They're also walking into the Haunted Forest, which was the very first place that the show started in the pilot episode. The Haunted Forest was where that first big scene where they saw the White Walkers was, where they opened the pilot episode. I know you're all asking the big question, how close is this ending to George R. R. Martin's ending in the books? I will do a separate video about that tomorrow because a lot of it will be the same, but there will be some differences. So don't worry, that'll be a whole separate video. There's so much to unpack and process about the finale. I still don't know how I feel about it. It's going to take me a couple days to figure it out. I will do a couple more videos talking a little bit more about the ending and what's next for the characters going forward because like Arya, Sansa, Jon, they're all still alive. 
Don't forget about the bonus episode that's airing next Sunday, too. I'll do a regular episode video for that, just like I would for any other Game of Thrones episode. But thank you so much. This has been so fun. I can't wait to start talking about the Game of Thrones prequel series. I'll start doing that later this week sometime. But leave all your bonus video requests in the comments below. Will you wait for everything? Click here for my episode 5 video and click here for my episode 4 video. Thank you so much for watching. Everybody stay awesome. I'll see you guys tonight.